Okay, people are filtering in. Give it about another 30 seconds or so. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on commercial heat pump RTU modeling. Uh, today's session is recorded. It will be available on the IBSA USA YouTube channel. Um, if you have any issues hearing the presentation, uh, you can try calling in instead of using the computer audio. It is a Zoom webinar, so you will be muted and off camera during the session. Uh, you can post questions that you have in the Q&A, and I'll be answering those as we go along. And by default, the chat is just sent to the presenters. If you want something that everyone sees, make sure you select the all panelists and all attendees uh, selection. If you have any questions, thoughts, or ideas that you um, want to contribute, um, please submit those. And our presenter today is Chris Caradonna. Chris is a commercial buildings research engineer at NREL. He joined in 2019 and he specializes in building simulation and energy modeling. His current work focuses on energy modeling to develop end use load profile data sets of all major end uses and building types in the commercial building stock to estimate the sort of time sensitive value of energy efficiency and demand response. Uh, prior to NREL, Chris was an energy consultant, worked on several projects in the US and internationally where he did energy modeling, studies, uh, lead compliant, uh, lead models, code compliance, and a range of other uh, different uh, work functions. So thanks, Chris, for your willingness to present this webinar today, and I'll pass it off to you. Sure. Thank you, Matt. Um, so as Matt stated, my name is Chris Caradonna, and today I'll be going over commercial uh, heat pump rooftop unit energy modeling, um, and it's application that we did for a mass adoption study um, using NREL's Comstock uh, energy modeling tool. Uh, I guess I can kind of go quickly over this. I'm an NREL engineer at, um, or I'm a commercial buildings research engineer at NREL. Prior to this, I was an energy consultant and I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. Uh, our agenda for today, I'll be doing a brief introduction. Um, I'll be going over the Comstock energy modeling tool once again, very briefly, um, just as it pertains to some results we'll be showing for uh, the mass adoption uh, analysis that we did applying the rooftop unit um, modeling. Um, then I'll be going over heat pump rooftop unit uh, energy modeling and how we went about doing that. Some results and we'll have a Q&A at the end. Uh, so first, about 25% or up to 30%, depending on what statistic you're looking at, of energy consumed in U.S. commercial buildings is for space heating, specifically from on-site combustion of fossil fuels. So if we want to talk about decarbonizing commercial buildings, naturally, we need to talk about decarbonizing um, this end use. Uh, rooftop units are the most prominent HVAC system type in commercial buildings. Um, statistics vary on this estimate, but it's usually about 45 uh, to 55 percent, at least in the United States. Um, so naturally, this is a pretty impactful decarbonization pathway that we can um, take. And rooftop unit retrofits or swap outs are a more straightforward uh, retrofit that one can do to electrify space heating. Um, of course, there can be complications. You may need a panel upgrade or roof weight or something may be a concern, but by and large, you can swap these units out, retain existing ductwork and so on. Um, I'm gonna spare everyone the overview of uh, the physics of how a basic heat pump works. Um, if you wanna see that, there's some great videos on YouTube that can probably do a better job than me. Um, but this brings us to our problem statement that a lack of credible uh, and relevant information can result in inaction. Most of our work is geared towards um, larger decision-making entities like cities, states, and utilities. Uh, but this can also apply to individual building owners and so on. But uh, people have questions like, will transitioning to a heat pump RTU uh, reduce carbon emissions in my city or save energy or overload the grid? 
Um, and that's really what we're trying to get at with our energy modeling studies. Uh, so the Comstock tool, um, assuming everyone on here is pretty familiar with energy modeling, but a typical energy model represents uh, the operation of usually one building. When we talk about stock energy modeling, we're talking about the operation of a collection of buildings or a building stock. And a stock can range from being a city, a state, a country. Um, for this presentation, when I say the building stock, I'm talking about commercial buildings in the US or all commercial buildings in the US. Uh, the Comstock tool is a bottom-up energy model of the US. Um, we use 350,000 uh, representative open studio or energy plus energy models to represent um, the variety of building characteristics um, that we have in commercial buildings. Um, and these are informed by various data sources. So we have the Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey, CoStar is a real estate database. Um, these data sources are used to inform our model inputs to get the right variety and properties in our models. Uh, and then we did a three-year calibration effort um, a project called End Use Load Profiles. We have a whole long detailed report on how that went um, to get these models to better align to actual data. Um, so you can look that up if you would like. Um, and in the end, we create public data sets um, that describe building stock characterization data, um, how and when and where buildings use energy, um, emissions data, but also um, the impact of different what-if scenarios or measure scenarios. So for this presentation, the impact of um, what if we applied heat pump RTUs to all commercial buildings in the U.S. Um, just a little more detail on this, uh, on the Comstock tool. In real life, there's multiple million commercial buildings in the U.S. In Comstock, I said we use 350,000 models to represent this. Um, so we don't model every single building like going down Main Street. We don't know the characteristics of every single building, but we do have distributions of characteristics from some of the data sources that I mentioned, like CBEX. So we use these distributions to inform all the different characteristics of our model at the same prevalence at which they occur in the real building stock. Um, so like I said, that was just to give a little bit of context on the Comstock tool for when I show results later. Um, if you're interested in more detail on this, we do have uh, comprehensive documentation at this link here. Um, so you can follow that and learn more or be happy to answer questions. Okay, uh, so then every six months, we release a batch of about eight to 10 energy efficiency measures uh, with the Comstock tool. Our, our last batch was at the end of March and our next batch will be in September. So this is the list that we have available right now. Today's presentation is going to be focused on just the top one, uh, heat pump RTU retrofit. It's applicable to about 45% of our stock floor area and it's replacing our gas and electric resistance RTUs with heat pump RTUs. Um, however, if you're interested in any of the others in this list, at the bottom, you'll see a link to the measure documentation. Um, we have also written comprehensive documentation on each of these measures if you're interested on how we went about the modeling for any of these. Okay, so now we're going to get into the heat pump rooftop unit modeling. Um, so just to do my due diligence as an energy modeler, um, there's limited comprehensive uh, heat pump performance maps that exist um, for especially these variable speed type of more complicated heat pumps for energy modeling. And this, of course, creates limitation in our understanding of the technologies. And then heat pumps are especially sensitive to performance assumptions, uh, much more so than if we were modeling like a gas furnace where we could pretty much plug in an 80% efficiency and call it a day in most cases. Um, so just note that these assumptions have an impact and consider them um, when applying this to any of your projects. Um, and also the assumptions and the path that we took represents just one of multiple possible approaches. We're not trying to state that this is the recommended approach or the optimal approach, but rather just that it is a reasonable approach. Um, so a snapshot of the whole picture here, I'll, I'll go through each of these in detail in the coming slides, but like I said, just to give us the whole picture on the heat pump RTU modeling we did here. Um, so this is written as a Ruby Open Studio measure for Open Studio models that then become Energy Plus simulations. Um, if you're not familiar with the term of Open Studio measures, usually measure is referring to like an energy efficiency measure or an upgrade to a building. 
an open studio measure uh, is like that, but it's also an automated script that automates a change to our building energy models. Um, so what I have produced here is an open studio measure to automate this modeling in uh, building energy models. I meant to get this up on the building component library before this presentation, but I have not yet. I will have that up next week. Um, but the concept of the measure is to replace our gas and electric resistance RTUs with heat pump RTUs. Um, we're modeling these as pretty top of the line systems. So variable speed units, high efficiency. Um, I have greater than 17 IEER here. IEER is a cooling metric. Um, at the time of writing this, there was no equivalent like part load performance heat pump heating metric. Although I believe that has changed and they are coming out with one if, if not already. Uh, but just note that we're trying to communicate that this is a high efficiency variable speed system. Um, as I mentioned, these are modeled with variable speed compressors. We model it as four stages and a variable speed fan. So this is a single zone VAV. Um, sizing, the compressor is sized to the design cooling load. This is a, a topic where there's a few options you can take that I'll talk about on the next slide, but this seems to be one of the most common options. So it's what I, I based our results on. Um, backup heating, we did electric resistance. Um, that's sized as needed. It could very well be uh, a gas, a furnace coil too in the rooftop unit. People usually call those dual fuel systems, but uh, for this uh, measure, at least the results show electric resistance, although the measure does allow you to choose uh, if you want a gas backup instead. Um, compressor lockout, this term basically just means below this temperature, the heat pump does not operate. You get no heat pump heating. You only get the heating from your supplemental heat source, which as I mentioned is electric resistance. Um, I have gotten some questions on where this value came from before, zero degrees. This is the default for the Dyke and Rebel in their uh, operation manual. Um, so the default program comes at zero degrees Fahrenheit. So that's what we chose here, although that value um, can be changed in the controller and it can make an impact on your peak demand and things like that, depending on what you use. Uh, but I'm just using the default, assuming that's what most people would do. Um, defrost, we use reverse cycle. That just means you run the heat pump basically in air conditioning mode. So the outside system gets hot and melts the ice, or I guess in a rooftop unit, the whole thing is outdoors, but I think you know what I mean. Um, and then our performance data source, uh, this is a mix of lab testing and manufacturing performance data that was used to make our performance curves. Um, this was done as part of previous um, efforts, not part of this project. So I can't really speak to the lab testing and such um, that went into this, uh, but I will illustrate the performance maps that we have. Okay, so first topic, sizing. As I mentioned before, the default that I have here is to size the heat pumps to cooling. Um, and then you have supplemental heating as needed to maintain a discharge air temperature. I'm not sure if this is how every heat pump rooftop unit works, but this is how it's described in the Dyke and Rebel uh, operations manual that the unit tries to meet um, a discharge air temperature set point. And if it's not meeting that, it will ramp up the compressor speed. If it still can't meet it, it will kick on um, the supplemental heating. Um, however, there are multiple options that you can do for heating with heat pumps. Um, I have some illustrated to the right. This is a resource from Natural Resources Canada. Um, this is one of the first resources I found a couple of years ago on uh, heat pump sizing methodologies and, and some guidance on that. Um, but basically, you can size it to cooling and use supplemental heating for whatever unmet heating load there might be. Um, or you can upsize the unit to meet more and more of the heating load with the heat pump. Um, there can be cycling concerns if you go too far with that. The variable speed compressors alleviate that um, to some extent, but um, you do lose capacity at lower temperatures with the heat pump. So if you want to meet the design heating load at your design temperature, um, you may need to upsize the unit by several X if you're in a climate zone where it's very heating dominated. And in that case, you might run into situations where the cooling is now much oversized. Um, so that's not really a concern for this measure. And we're modeling these as variable speed systems, which lessens that concern, but just keep that in mind. Um, other concerns with upsizing, it will increase the unit's weight. Um, I have heard anecdotal talk about building owners being concerned about that in some applications. Um, if you upsize too much, you might need to increase the cabinet size, which means you might need another 
uh, different size like footprint for your system. Um, and then obviously cost considerations. Um, the measure does allow you to accommodate multiple sizing options, sizing to different temperatures like we see in the load line over to the right. Um, but the results that I'll be showing here will be for sizing just to cooling, which like I said, from feedback I've gotten from both Daikin and people who do uh, our mechanical MEP firms that sizing to cooling is, is the most common. Uh, okay, so then I mentioned before that we model this as a four-stage unit. Um, in Energy Plus, this is the coil heating DX multi-speed object. I'm sure other modeling softwares have um, a similar type of object. Um, to the left, that plot shows how this operates for just one sample model uh, based on the supply air mass flow rate and the predicted sensible load. Um, a negative load indicates cooling, positive load indicates heating. So we can see how as the load increases, we increase our speed on the unit and we um, tear up in speeds and increase our flow rate as well. Um, for fan flow, the default that we use here is 40%. Um, this is also a default from Daikin's um, operation manual for the Daikin Rebel. Um, residential systems can go lower than this with default because they don't have the outdoor air concerns that commercial buildings do. Uh, but I guess that brings up my next topic. Um, if some buildings, the outdoor air requirement is going to make it so you need more than 40% minimum flow rate just to maintain your 62.1 ventilation rates, the way I modeled this is you will lose the lower speeds um, if your outdoor air rate is beyond their capability. So in some extreme examples, like maybe in a very high density area, um, this may actually be modeled more like a 100% outdoor air constant volume system uh, as you won't be able to turn down your speed. But that's not a concern for most. Most buildings will have the 40% and the four speeds that I've listed here. Um, we also introduce cycling losses. I'll talk about that a little bit later. That, that applies to speed one only. Um, since this is a variable speed unit, we don't want to apply the cycling losses uh, in between the other speeds that we're using just to represent variable speed. Okay, uh, probably one of the most impactful parts of this modeling is our heating performance maps. We have COP as a function of temperature, and on the next slide, I will show uh, capacity as a function of temperature. Um, so on the y-axis, we have our indoor air dry bulb temperature. On the x-axis, we have our outdoor air dry bulb temperature. And then I mentioned we modeled this as four speeds. So we have our stage one, two, three, and four shown on the screen. Um, I do have this similar performance maps or corresponding for cooling as well. I'm not showing them in this presentation, uh, but they are in that documentation that I mentioned before. The only difference is uh, the indoor air dry bulb temperature is indoor air wet bulb temperature for those maps. Um, but some key takeaways that we see from this, um, first, as we would expect, we see lower efficiencies at lower temperatures. Um, you can model these with only one variable. You can model them with only outdoor air dry bulb temperature. But as you can see from some of these maps, uh, you would lose some explained variance if you did that. Uh, we do have variation based on the indoor air temperature. That really just goes back to the basic principles of a heat engine with your indoor and outdoor temperatures kind of driving your COP. Um, some other uh, callouts that I have here, um, we see generally higher efficiencies at some of the lower compressor speeds. Um, and this is really because when you go to a lower compressor speed with a variable speed system, uh, you now have a bigger heat exchange surface for the amount of uh, load that you're meeting. So kind of similar to how you can increase your um, residential home um, air conditioning like SEER if you get a bigger coil. Um, same kind of concept when you go down in the compressor speed and are addressing lower loads, you now have a bigger heat exchanger. Um, so that is reflected here that we see higher efficiencies at some of these lower part load conditions. Okay, similar layout, but now we're looking at capacity reduction as a function of temperature. Um, so you could read these as just reduction factors. Like if you see 0.8, that means your rated capacity, which happens at 47 degrees uh, at whatever temperature you're looking at would be times 0.8 or 0.6. Um, so this is showing capacity reductions here. 
uh, in a way. Um, so as we would expect, we see our lower capacity, uh, lower available heat pump capacities at our lower outdoor air temperatures. We see less impact with indoor air dry bulb temperature in this case, so still some, but you could probably get away with just doing outdoor air dry bulb because um, there isn't that much variation in that direction. Okay, cycling losses. Um, so this is representing lost efficiency when the compressor turns on and off a bunch. Um, so we introduce up to 25% efficiency loss based on the part load ratio. If you're not familiar with part load ratio, um, Energy Plus and other energy modeling softwares, they have a time step. And if the load is less, if the average load during that time step is less than the compressor, um, the rated compressor speed, um, we apply a part load uh, ratio to that um, for the portion of the uh, time step. Um, so if it turns out that the load is only 10% of the uh, compressor uh, rated load, we would apply about a 75% factor to that. So we would lose about 25% of the efficiency to reflect the cycling. I feel like I went about explaining that weird, but hopefully that made sense. Uh, okay, so then some performance comparisons. So first and foremost, this is not an apples to apples comparison. Um, some of these are rated performance uh, from a spec sheet. The carrier unit is from uh, test data from a lab from a study um, in 2015. So just note, this isn't apples to apples, AHRI testing conditions or anything like that. Uh, but we're just trying to illustrate how we compare to other units at some uh, reference points to see if we're kind of close um, or if we're very far off. So we have COP retention here and capacity retention, both as a function of outdoor air temperature. Um, the blue is our model heat pump RTU. Um, and then the, we have a Dyke and Rebel, the carrier test unit and a Ream uh, Renaissance unit. Uh, so starting with the COP retention, um, if we look down to the negative 17, 18 Celsius, which is zero Fahrenheit, uh, also noting zero Fahrenheit is our compressor lockout. Um, we see about 55% capacity retained at our full speed um, for our modeled unit. Um, the carrier unit was about 52%. Um, so we see pretty reasonable alignment over there. We're not way out in left field. And similarly with capacity retention, um, same thing, zero degrees. We're about 45%. Um, the Ream Renaissance shows about 42%. Um, so overall, um, just doing our due diligence comparing to other data sources, we see this as pretty reasonable alignment with the way we're modeling it. Um, oh, defrost. Um, so as many of us probably know, heat pumps require periodic defrost. Um, ice can build up on the outdoor unit or in the rooftop unit, just the backside of it, um, often below 40 degrees. And even though 40 degrees is still above freezing temperature when you're in heating mode, that coil can get much colder than that. So ice can build up. Um, there's a few methods to do defrost. Um, the first is reverse cycle. This is what I have seen as most common, at least in rooftop units, uh, where you just run the refrigeration cycle backwards to heat up the unit periodically. This can be based on a time cycle. So like below 40 degrees, if you're using the heat pump for heating, it runs for seven minutes on the hour that you're actually running the heat pump. Um, I have seen some data and studies that show that times defrost can be more inefficient because it overuses the defrost cycle. It defrosts when there is no ice buildup in some cases, which leads to more use of supplemental heating, more energy spent defrosting, and so on. Um, and then there's on-demand defrost, which often considers humidity. If there's no humidity in the outdoor air, even if we're very cold, we're unlikely to get ice buildup. Um, I have modeled this using the on-demand. Um, that seemed to correspond better to the Daikin unit that I was basing this off of. Um, their controls were kind of in between these. They don't actually have a humidity sensor, but they do um, classify it as a high dehumidification period and low dehumidification period based on refrigerant cycle temperatures and such. Um, so that was kind of a judgment call that on-demand might be more appropriate for that. Um, and then you can also use the electric resistance coil um, to do the defrost instead, although I have not seen this myself on rooftop units, um, but I do know that it occurs to some extent. 
Um, for energy plus modelers out there, um, note that in the time step that this is applied to, um, we use 15 minute time steps for our modeling. Um, this actually applies a reduction factor to the capacity for the entire time step. It calculates how much capacity should be lost during our 15 minute period due to defrost. So in practice, during a 15 minute time step, in real life, it might be five minutes, you have no heat pump capacity, you're, you're defrosting and you're using all supplemental heat. Um, the way this is working is the full 15 minutes, you just get a reduced capacity. So that may um, deviate a little bit uh, from how actual units work, but it's what we had to work with. Um, a few concerns and limitations. Um, this is specifically going to be for the Energy Plus side of things if you're using that tool. Uh, the multi-speed coil object, um, I did not see it uh, cycle the same way with um, unoccupied times as the single speed coil. Uh, I illustrate this to the right with an extreme example where our minimum airflow ratio was one, but during the occupied times, you can see the blue, the single speed constant volume example, and the red, the multi-speed, um, they align with each other. During unoccupied periods, the blue constant volume goes into Energy Plus's part load um, ratio cycling calculations and give us, gives us very low uh, part load airflow, whereas the multi-speed system stays much higher and doesn't seem to go in that same part load ratio calculation. This is all pretty detailed, but this is something that I saw. It is not as impactful with other models that have lower minimum flow ratios. Like I said, this is an extreme example where it's one, um, but it is still something that can deviate um, your fan savings a little bit from uh, what you might expect in reality. Uh, since our constant volume unit is actually showing lower fan usage than the variable speed unit, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I also observed limited usage of supplemental heating during times where there were adequate, where there was adequate heat pump capacity. This was limited, but I just wanted to call it out that I did see that. Um, and I also found longer simulation times occurring um, with this heat pump modeling, especially when you're doing the variable speed fans as well. And it has to go into the VAV kind of iteration solver. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some results. Um, this, these results are from the Comstock tool. Uh, before we show them, just a few notes. CBEX is one of the data sources that we compare Comstock results against. Um, I just want to call out that compared to CBEX, we are higher on electric heating energy in Comstock and lower on gas heating energy. So when you're looking at stock results, it's, it's hard to say who is right, who is wrong, who's closer. These are all estimates, uh, but we do want to be responsible and call that out. And that can impact um, stock level um, savings results, of course. Um, so site energy savings. So this is for the whole building stock including non-applicable buildings. This is the whole stock site energy savings. Um, we see 42% heating gas savings or 190 tera BTU. This is simply from electrifying the, furn the gas furnaces um, that were previously gas and now they're gonna be electric. We then see a negative 3% heating electricity savings. This one's a little bit more complicated. We have an electricity heating penalty from uh, switching previously gas systems to electricity heat pump systems. That's gonna add electricity to the stock. But I also mentioned that this study, we were replacing electric resistance units as well. So when you replace a less efficient electric resistance unit with a higher COP heat pump, we get some savings there. Um, so in the end, this does result in a net electric heating penalty of, of negative 3%. Um, and then we see 16% cooling electricity savings and 24% fan electricity savings. Uh, this is simply from using a high efficiency variable speed unit um, with variable speed fans. These savings uh, could be attributed to a non-heat pump RTU that is high performance. I like to call that out. Um, so like the Daikin Rebel does come in just like a gas furnace version, you would probably see similar cooling and fan electricity savings with that. Um, I also want to point out that I know I mentioned multiple times, this is modeled as a variable speed unit, but these savings are attributed to a pretty top of the line premium unit. So this is not meant to represent any heat pump RTU, especially uh, single speed units. Um, so peak demand, this is non-coincident. So this is just individual building level peak demand. 
Um, this is for the whole building, but only Comstock buildings that had gas RTUs. So we're no longer looking at the electric resistance RTUs here. Um, so we have the distribution of max daily winter peak intensity. Um, the baseline is our Comstock building stock of today. Um, and then below is the uh, same gas RTU buildings, except now with the heat pump RTU measure applied to it. And we can see a 22% uh, winter electric peak intensity increase for the median building when doing this transition. Um, a lot of that culminates in the blue, the cold. If you look at the top, between one and three watts per square foot, the blue is pretty thick. If you now go to the bottom, it's much thinner in that lower peak intensity bands and it shifts to the higher peak intensity bands. So I don't think this is a surprise, but we do see higher winter peak um, electricity usage because we're switching from using gas to electric heating. So that, that makes sense. Okay, so now this is looking at average uh, annual heating COP by state. So this averages the heat pump RTU annual efficiency in each building model, and then um, averages all the building models in each state, and that's what we get here. This includes, the COP calculation includes energy from defrost and supplemental heating directly. So the more you use supplemental heating and defrost, the lower these COPs will be. Um, the patterns, I think, are pretty much what people would expect in the West Coast and in the South and Southeast. We see generally higher COPs, um, where temperatures are a little bit uh, more moderate, less cold. And in the colder regions of the country, like the Midwest and the Northeast, uh, we see some lower COPs with, um, looks like North Dakota having some of the lowest with about 2.1. Um, now, there's a few reasons for this. The most obvious one is, uh, as we saw, the heat pumps are more efficient in warmer climates. So, of course, um, or warmer outdoor air temperatures. So, of course, warmer climates would be expected to have um, higher COPs from that sense. But we also saw um, that the heat pumps are more efficient at lower part load ratios with these variable speed units. And that's much more likely to happen in our more temperate, moderate climate zones than in the colder climate zones. Um, so yeah, I think, I think this is more or less what we would expect. Um, and lastly, these higher COPs that we see, four and five, this is really only gonna be possible with these variable speed units, at least with the technology I've seen today, um, where we get some of those higher efficiencies at those variable speed conditions. So a constant speed heat pump unit probably wouldn't see this high of efficiencies. Um, now this shows average percent of supplemental heating by state. Um, so I put the question in the box there to make this a little clearer. Uh, what percentage of heat pump heating electricity is coming from supplemental heat? So when we talk about electricity that is powering a heat pump system, we have some going towards the actual compressor heat pump. Some of that is going to be used to defrost that heat pump sometimes, and some is going to be going towards an electric supplemental coil. Um, so we see a, a wide range here, um, ranging from, I think, 6% at the lowest all the way up to 56%. Um, and pretty much, once again, as we would expect, the warmer climate zones have very little supplemental heat usage. There may still be some from defrost and some colder areas for small amounts of time, but for the most part, our supplemental heat kicks on in the colder climates, as, like I said, we would expect. Um, I'm not going to talk about this too much. This just summarizes the data sets that we released with the Comstock tool that has all of this measure and baseline data. Um, I think Matt has dropped the slide deck in the chat. Uh, if not, you can see the links down there at the bottom of how you can access this data if you want to. Um, the building models are also available. So there's hundreds of thousands of open studio energy models or millions if you include all of our upgrades. Um, that you can pull from if you want those, um, but also all of the results, time series results. We have a data viewer. We have an S3 database that you can query. Um, I have a webinar that I linked to the bottom introducing how to access this data. You can also email us um, at the, one of these email addresses here, but that is my presentation and we'll be happy to answer questions. Matt, if you're talking, we can't hear you.
Still working? I can hear you now, yep. Okay, great. Okay, yeah, if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A portion. So first one here, what is the minimum speed of the variable speed compressor? Um, 30%. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, and, and like I said, that depends on if the outdoor air permits the speeds to get that low, but assuming it does. It's okay, next question. Uh, usually we see crankcase heaters, especially for cold climate air source heat pumps. Do the performance maps for COP include this? Uh, no, the crankcase heaters are modeled separately, energy plus at least. Um, but I guess if that's not the case in whatever software you're using, you would want to uh, integrate that into the performance curves. Great. Uh, next question. Have you compared the Energy Plus heat pump performance results with other software such as from IES, uh, IESVE? Uh, I have not, but that's a good Uh, another question, did you look at the change in utility cost in each region? No, we did not model utility costs um, for Comstock at this time. That is on the docket, I believe, for next year. Um, that gets a little bit complicated for us. We model at the county level and different structures vary quite a bit across the country down to the county level. Um, so we hope to get that into the Comstock tool next year, but we did not do that for this analysis. Okay, and a final question here. Are the performance curve coefficients published somewhere? Um, they are in the models that we have published, but I will include those in... Uh, they'll be included in the measure that I post on BCL, like within the measure. Um, so if that's good enough, then... Uh, they'll be published there. Okay, great. Another one. Um, have you looked at the dual fuel systems in colder climates where they're using electric resistance uh, or electric resistance does not work? Um, so I made the measure capable of doing so, and I did some light testing with that. And of course, it, it reduces peak demand and things of that nature. Um, I mentioned that we release measures in six month cycles for Comstock. That is actually going to be part of our September release. So currently the data set has electric resistance backup only. The September release will dual fuel gas backup option as well. Okay, great. Yeah, and if anyone wants the links and I think the first question that was answered uh, in the answer to that, I posted a lot of links to the documentation. Uh, another question here, were DOAS units looked at? And if so, what were the ISMRE values? No, we did not include DOAS units at this time for this measure. Okay. okay great. Um, if anybody else has any more questions, I'll give about uh, two more seconds to enter those. Okay, um, yeah, I don't see any more questions. So if you do, uh, and you're curious of modeling these things, you can email uh, Chris, uh, email is on the screen. Oh, wait, we just had some more pop up, one second. Sure. Uh, when is this measure gonna be released on BCL? Uh, next week. Next week, okay, great. Yeah, sorry about that, I meant to have it up for today, but <laughs> I needed to get this presentation done first. And is there more validation beyond comparison to lab results? Um, we hope so in the future. I liked the idea of comparing to what other energy tools um, are showing and the curves that they use there. I know that we potentially have projects to do um, more lab testing data on heat pump RTU specifically at NREL. Um, so I, I hope that works out and we have more data there to compare to. But if you have other studies that you think gives a good snapshot of something to compare to, um, I'd, I'd be happy to review that as well. You can send that to us. Okay, I don't see any more questions. 
think we can end early and give people some time back. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, this recording will be posted on the YouTube channel. So if you want to subscribe to that YouTube channel, uh, you can get access to this video and the links will also be in that uh, in the YouTube video. Um, if you enjoyed this webinar, um, our next event is on June 22nd at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, which is an IPSA mixer. Um, and you can find the, the link for that and registration for that in the IPSA newsletter if you're subscribed to that or on the IPSA website. Uh, and you can sign up for that event. Um, I don't have, I think if someone wants to post, yep, the link is posted in chat. If you want to. And feel free if you have any questions about IPSA to follow up with admin at ipsa.us. So thanks everyone and have a great rest of the day.